Okay, because we have three fabulous presenters as well as a wonderful moderator, I do not want to waste time. So I will go ahead and start. We may get a few more attendees joining us. Welcome to everyone. My name is Amy Kropel and I am the director at the UF Center for European Studies. Our center is a federally funded Title VI National Resource Center and a Jean Monnet Center of Excellence, as well as part of the JM in the US network of Jean Monnet programs. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. Today's discussion will be recorded and will be available on the CES website after editing. We will have a Q&A session following the presentation, and we ask that participants submit their questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen rather than using the chat function. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. We're here to discuss success and challenges for the EU's external cultural relations. This talk and the virtual series that it is part of are supported by the EU's Erasmus Plus Jean Monnet program. This panel is part of our series on EU cultural policy beyond masters and museums, which has explored the history, politics, and implementation of EU cultural policy, examining issues such as cultural heritage protection, participation and inclusion in EU cultural heritage, and global heritage in EU foreign policy. Our panel today includes uh, William Deco, who is the Principal Policy Officer, Integrated Approach for Security and Peace Directorate at the European External Action Service. He has been developing the EU concept on cultural heritage in conflicts and crises as component for peace and security in EU external, external action. Damien Heli, who is Chair of Cultural Solutions, runs the consultancy group DH Creative Partnerships and is a visiting professor at the Department of International Relations and Diplomacy at the College of Europe. And he has published extensively on the EU's external action and international cultural relations. And our third panelist, Elke Selter, is a research fellow with the British Institute for International and Comparative Law. And she has co-authored a study on the EU's response to heritage in the Middle East and together with ICCROM, developed toolkit for conflict analysis in the heritage sector. Full bios for all of our panelists are available on the event page and will also be placed on the website with the recording of this presentation. Our panel today is moderated by Kristen Hausler, who is one of our three guest scholars leading the UFJMCE special seminar and virtual workshop series on EU cultural policy this year. She is the Dorset Senior Fellow and Director of the Center for International Law at the British Institute of International and Comparative Law and co-editor of Cultural Heritage in the European Union, a critical inquiry into law and policy. And with that, I will hand it over to our moderator today, Kristen. Please remember for all attendees at the end of the talk, you will be taken immediately to an event survey. And we ask that you kindly take a few minutes to complete this to assist us in evaluating how we can create more interesting events in the future. Kristen, I hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Amy, for the introduction. And thank you again for having invited uh, Francesca Fiorentini, Andrea Jakubowski, and I, not just to host the, the webinar series, but also to teach uh, this whole course at the University of Florida. And I, I think I believe I speak on behalf of us all uh, if I say that we really have enjoyed uh, this experience very much working with you and the rest of your team. And I also hope that this will be the beginning of future cooperation, actually in the spirit of today's discussion. Uh, today, our speakers will be discussing the use of culture and cultural heritage uh, in external relations. And of course, over the past decade, the EU has sought to strategize its use of heritage in external action and develop its efforts to strengthen relation uh, through culture and work uh, in equal cooperation with external partners. Uh, but of course, in reality, this uh, has its own challenges and there's a very difficult sometimes balance to strike. There are always risks of straining rather than strengthening relationships when culture is involved in international projects. Um, and I just wanted to mention one example um, with the current debate surrounding the reconstruction of Mosul. Last week, it was announced that an international jury selected an entry by eight Egyptian architects um, as the winner of the international competition that had been organized for the reconstruction of the Al Nuri mosque complex in Mosul in Iraq. Now this historic mosque and surrounding area had been destroyed by ISIS, 
Uh, and its reconstruction is part of the Revive the Spirit of Mosul project, which is a UNESCO-led project for the rehabilitation of this ancient city, but it is a project to which the EU has made a significant contribution. Now, the Director uh, General of UNESCO has said in relation to that project that the reconstruction of this mosque uh, will be a landmark uh, in the process of advancing reconciliation and social cohesion. She added that heritage sites and historical monuments are powerful catalysts for people's sense of belonging, of community and identity, and that it is through education and culture that Iraqis will be able to regain control of their destiny and become actors in the renewal of their country. Now, of course, um, if you take this statement into account, uh, it may perhaps uh, seem a little bit unfortunate that local architects were not selected for the reconstruction of the project. And actually, the winning entry for the reconstruction of the mosque is already the object of some criticism, uh, with a number of Iraqi uh, having said that the modernist plan uh, was perhaps not necessary and that the site did not necessarily need a redesign. So this is just one example uh, that shows a number of very difficult and challenging uh, questions uh, that are raised uh, in this area. And I'm sure that the speakers will raise a number of further questions. Uh, so as Amy mentioned, please do not hesitate to ask your questions along the way um, to the panelists and we'll put the questions to them at the very end uh, of their presentation. Now, without further ado, I would like to uh, yield the floor to our first speaker, LK Selter, who will be uh, talking about the role of Europe for Heritage as an instrument of international politics. Thank you, Christine. Um, and thanks for inviting me, everyone. Um, now, uh, I will talk to you about the history of Europe's involvement with, with heritage on a global stage. And I'll do so um, <laughs> despite my recent research having looked much more at what Christine look, just talked about. So I've looked very much at the past decade. But since Guillaume and Damien will both talk about the present and the future, I thought it may also serve this panel to go a bit back in time and to look at you know <laughs> how Europe uh, became such an important player globally when it comes to cultural heritage. Um, you know, despite everyone all over the world having heritage, right? Um, now, I'm a political scientist and I look at heritage as a global norm in the political social sense uh, and thereby just look, then look at how um, heritage has come to play a role in international relations, especially in the last 75 years. And um, I will do this uh, in the next let's say 15 minutes, uh, especially with a focus on, on the role that Europe has played in this, with, with the purpose of, of, of showing a bit why it really matters what Europe does. And so why it really matters what then <laughs> Guillaume and Damien will talk about. So um, let's go back to 1945, um, the end of the Second World War, when the international community came together and first of all, of course, created the United Nations. But very shortly afterwards, um, that same international community also created UNESCO, and this is a matter of months, when they met in London and they created the UN agency, which had a mandate for culture and heritage. And um, I jumped here, of course, as you've noticed, from talking about Europe, talking about European states, to talking about UNESCO. Um, why? Because if you want to influence something globally, if you want to uh, impose your idea on heritage globally, as an individual state, that's quite hard to do. Um, and so international organizations have often been seen as very useful vehicles for especially powerful countries to impose their norms globally, uh, because they, since they are composed of, of member states, they're, they're seen to have the legitimacy and the authority to speak on behalf of the international community as a whole. So if, if as a member state or, or a group of member states, you manage to influence the thinking of these organizations, you can actually manage to influence the thinking globally about certain topics. And in the heritage field, UNESCO has been the vehicle through which this has been done. So looking at who has had power within UNESCO, um, when the core of the heritage norm that we, we know today was being shaped really 
um, matters. And, um, you know, back in 1945, it were the three allied powers of the, world, the Second World War that were at the basis of creating UNESCO, the US, the UK and France. Um, they were not alone, of course, but they had leading positions. The UK organized the convention that created UNESCO. The US was chairing it and drafting the constitution. France immediately offered to host UNESCO. The UK also delivered the first director general. And so these three have along throughout its history played a very powerful role, but not in the same way, <laughs> because quite early on, and this did not only happen in UNESCO, you see this in other international bodies as well, the Anglo-Saxon countries, so the UK and the US, started being very critical of the organization they had just created. They didn't really like the way in which it was going. And you see that criticism growing over the years for different reasons. In the 60s, the reasons are very different from the 70s and the 80s, but they remain highly critical. And in the 80s, the US actually leaves. UK follows. <laughs> copies the US. And what happens then is there arrives a period of about two decades, which is a really essential period for UNESCO, when two of the three founding members are actually not there. Uh, they'll both return in the early 2000s. And as we all know, the US left again uh, in after the 2011 accession of, of Palestine. So that left, in a way, the way wide open for France to play a very important role in this organization. And in addition, they were, of course, also the host country, which they still are, because UNESCO is, is based in Paris. And France will quite quickly, on um, quite soon onwards, be joined by other European countries in this. Huh? It's, Italy is an, an early one. Uh, Spain joins, <laughs> becomes a strong player at some point, delivering the director general as well. Um, and, and so as UNESCO became more and more important on the global stage, as it started developing more conventions, gained more traction and influence, it were really those European countries that were steering it. Now, of course, you have to place this within its time frame. 50s, 60s, large parts of the world were still under colonial rule. So there were not as many you know, individual states as there are today. This is full, full Cold War within these international bodies. Communist bloc had a very particular place um, and so on and so forth. Now, but what did this European domination, if I can call it that way, meant for UNESCO's approach to heritage? Well, of course, that, that the European view on what valuable heritage was and, and how it should be preserved became, became the standard, the, 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 the model upon which these conventions at UNESCO were drafted and the model upon which UNESCO's actions were, were defined. UNESCO itself has, has in recent years very often been criticized by this, right? This is not something I, I make up. There's plenty of authors who've, who've been writing about this. Um, and if you, you can see, if you trace uh, the history of, of, of UNESCO's heritage efforts, whether it's the conventions, its operational activities, the technical support it provides to governments around the world, um, that, that this, this, this core European view on heritage, which is uh, very material based, for instance, we really appreciate uh, old materials, authentic materials, um, different from countries like Japan, for instance, where it's more the process that matters. Um, we have a very reified view on heritage, right? We prefer something we can draw a nice boundary around. Um, <laughs> very much, um, valuing technical expertise, uh, very much looking at conservation standards and so on and so forth. And so gradually this idea on, on, on what types of heritage mattered and how they should be preserved were spread globally. And this is, this is of course not new, there's precedence to this. You can see the colonial regimes which have their own heritage institutions ha have into a certain extent also um, you know, transfer these approaches to heritage uh, to, to, to their colonial uh, um, territories. Um, but conventions, you know, once you start creating conventions like the World Heritage Convention, which became extremely popular, um, this, this of course was, was much facilitated. And I know that I'm moving very fast, but in, you can see, for instance, how in the early years of UNESCO, um, uh, standards were set. So papers were commissioned, uh, concepts were defined, the first conventions were written up, and they've served as a basis over and over again for the ones that followed. Um, and this was mainly done by European experts and events here organized in Europe. Um, again, there's quite a lot of even quantitative research that, that looks 
for instance, at who participated in essential meetings. And there you see that the ratio of, of the West against the rest is totally off balance. So you can have a nine to one ratio of European participants versus non-European ones. Um, in addition to the fact that a lot of these non-European participants were there without much power, they, they were either far isolated or represented countries which were under colonial domination. Um, <laughs> Of course, uh, 60s colonization ends, uh, these newly independent states join UNESCO um, and, and UNESCO also start shifting some of its programs to, to countries in the global south. But what you see at that time is rather than um, reopening the debate and rather than starting rediscussing, you know, what, what is heritage really and which form, you know, are there different ways of heritage, uh, you know, looking at heritage or preserving it and should we change this approach, for instance, this didn't really happen. They shifted from a defining what the norm is to a dissemination. So meetings that were then organized uh, were very much about teaching other countries how they should do it. And you see the same with uh, the actions uh, at the time where um, experts are sent to countries of the global south to help them, for instance, establish national policies, to help them identify or document national heritage, to help them with specific technical issues on how, how to preserve sites. And you know, we all know about the big campaigns in Angkor, for instance, in Borobudur in Indonesia, and in Mojadar in Pakistan, but also in, in smaller projects is very much, again, predominantly European experts and this is for a cultural heritage right natural heritage you get much more Americans as well um, for cultural heritage mainly European experts who are, will be sent around the world to teach other uh, countries how to do it of course following these standards of I now very often say UNESCO, but other bodies like ICOMOS, which by then were, were strongly integrated with UNESCO, uh, propagated, of course, the same standards. And this was all related to this uh, valuing of technical expertise, technical expertise, which was taught at European universities. Um, as more non-Western practitioners start gaining interest in heritage, you see that they will also come to Europe to study how to deal with heritage, right? So you have big institutions in France and Italy. It's an important one in Belgium here where I am, uh, which was founded by one of the founders of ICOMOS, which also has had an international program for, for many decades now. Um, so again, you see that the, 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 the practitioners who are not from Europe will come here, they study, they'll, they'll learn how we deal with heritage and then they'll go back to their own countries where they will lead heritage departments, they will become directors of national museums and so on. And as a way, they become echo chambers of this, this model that was created here. Um, and so gradually you could, ease, you could actually map that. And at some point in my career, I actually want to do that. Uh, you can see how, how gradually this standard has been spread around the world until what you have today, where you see that the way in which uh, government departments dealing with heritage are structured, uh, dividing tangible and intangible museums, archives, uh, dividing them from sites, um, it's all very much the same. Huh? And it didn't used to be that way. Um, I'm simplifying this. There is, have been attempts to nuance this. Um, and when these attempts have been carried out by countries that were powerful enough, they have had a certain degree of success. Uh, Japan, for instance, has, has made a lot of efforts uh, in the 90s. Then, then we see kind of late 90s, early 2000s, Canada and, and Australia have done a lot. But efforts by less powerful countries, for instance, by the Africa group in the 80s have been really uh, knocked down as it were. So you see how, how the Western powers, and this is at a time when, when the US and UK are, are gone, um, they will start using political and financial influence uh, to make sure that these alternative views don't really stick. Um, so <laughs> I, I have mainly talked about Europe. And, and European states individually, not so much about the EU, because uh, in these early days, of course, the EU, that, as we know it today, didn't exist. Um, but the arrival of the EU, and, and I'll be very short on this, um, I think has reinforced this picture, as it were. Um, because the, the individual European member states today remain very important within UNESCO. They, they all have a seat at the table, of course. Um, it's a one country, one vote system. So, so in principle, they're outnumbered by the rest of the world, but they have uh, financially strong power. 
And of course they have, <laughs> I guess somehow the historic legacy of having, having a strong voice, but the EU has been added to this and the EU is not a member state in its own right because it's a transnational body, um, but it has become UNESCO's biggest donor. Um, in terms of extra budgetary funding. And uh, the largest part of the EU budget, I checked once more this morning, is going to, to the culture sector. So that, in a way, it doubles up on the power that Europe has. It still has a strong seat at the table. And now there is the EU in addition, which, you know, because it's still the composition of the same member states, but, it, but in terms of the presence, it, it's much more present within the organization than it has been before. But also, and I think that's what uh, Guillaume may be talking about, in, in the last decade, which is what my current research has, has been about, um, also outside of UNESCO, the interest in heritage has increased. Our bodies like the Security Council, like the International Criminal Court have become interested in heritage. And there again, you see that this is very much led by the European countries. France, once more, especially for the Security Council, has taken up a leading role together with Italy and very quickly on backed by, by the EU at the time by uh, Andrew Mogherini. Um, and interesting to me is that this is absolutely not being challenged on an international stage. And then maybe if there's people with other experiences, I'm happy to, <laughs> to hear them. But to me, it doesn't seem like this is much challenged internationally. Um, it's considered a European thing. Um, if France wants a, con a resolution on cultural heritage, it's about, this is France's thing, so let's support France. And some countries may have certain points of criticism on specific elements, um, but it's not like in other domains of international relations where there is a bit of a turf war on who who's, who's going to take care of this particular topic. Um, of course, among the big powers, the US is in a bit of a, a bizarre position since it's out of UNESCO. Um, but also China and Russia don't seem to really care much on an international level what this this heritage thing can do for them um, they do or have a big interest in heritage um, they do a lot nationally they do a lot regionally to assert you know regional identities re domination over certain regions um, but i have i do not have the impression that um, they have a particularly different view on heritage, which they would want to become the global standard. Let's put it that way, right? So there's no competition on that. And this is really Europe's thing. And, and if you look through uh, statements that's been made also by the EU, um, they also realize that it's their thing. Um, so, so to end, uh, I just want to emphasize that I don't necessarily see this as a negative thing, right? Um, it's not because <laughs> Europe has been dominant um, that, that this has to be bad. Uh, I think this can also be good. Um, what matters is that, you know, Europe's normative power in this area at the moment remains extremely strong and does not seem to be particularly challenged, which means that if within the heritage field we want to see changes, if we want a different approach, if we want perhaps a more diverse approach, that we actually have to count on Europe for, for pushing for this. Um, and that's if there would be changes at a European level on how heritage is perceived or how heritage is perceived in international relations, that this is very likely to have global, global resonance. Um, and, and I'll end with that because uh, this, this makes me very interested in, in hearing what, what Guillaume and, and Demia will talk about. Thank you. Thanks a lot. You've raised uh, at least five or six questions uh, in my head. So I'm sure uh, many, uh, many of those listening also have a lot of questions. So please do uh, put them in the, in the Q&A box. I won't ask any uh, of those questions right now. Uh, I'll leave also uh, the audience a bit of time to, to think of their own questions. And I'll just yield the floor now to Guillaume, who will be speaking on cultural heritage in conflict and crisis. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Christian. Um, thanks a lot for, for having me. My, uh, greetings from, from Brussels, Europe. And uh, many thanks at the University of Florida, the Center for European Studies, Jean Monnet, for, for having me today especially to, to Professor Armie Kreppel, you, Dr. Christine Hausler, and, and Corinne Thomasy. 
uh, really glad to have the opportunity to provide you insights on, on the recent work that, that we engaged within the, uh, the European Union and cultural heritage in our external relations, and especially in relation to, to, to KISS. So uh, my intervention today, like a like frame the past, the present, or future, I know, like this, uh, this image, will focus on uh, this particular aspect, cultural heritage in conflicts and crisis, which is really at the crossroad of our diplomatic engagement on culture, but also on defense and, and security. Uh, also really welcome and glad uh, the other speaker, Elke and, uh, and Damien, really friendly colleagues that were, were part of uh, some engagement that, that we have to, together. Um, I know that it's the end of the semester for you and we are all kind of zoom out, so I will not have any PPT, so you, you will have to, to follow my voice and, and I will articulate my, um, my presentation in three points. The first one, a kind of sense to, to to frame cultural heritage within the uh, European Union external action. The second one will be how we integrate cultural heritage in our peace process. And the last one would be the, the new political framework that the European Union is about to launch in a, in a couple of days. First of all, I'll provide you a brief sense setter where do we come from. Elke perfectly recalled, uh, and it was a very brilliant piece of history on cultural heritage and Europe after World War II. And you may surely remember that cultural heritage and including religious uh, one is enshrined in the core text of the Union and the Treaty of the European Union itself. It's, uh, it's the second para, if I recall correctly, that described cultural, religious and humanitarian heritage as an inspiration, both for the integration process, the peace project and the development of values, uh, the human right, the liberty, democracy, rule of law, equality, and so on. In a nutshell, and this is more or less the project of, of the European Union, uh, a value-driven actor and uh, with a human-centered approach. And this is what today more or less drive the European Union external engagement, uh, a peace project and sharing values. And this we have incorporated in our approach for cultural heritage in European Union external engagement. And for, forgive me, it, it might be a, a bit of a simplistic, but what work we think that what work for the inside may also work for, for the outside. And this uh, is really translated in the recent uh, European Union legal framework for cultural heritage that we adopted. And mainly, uh, I'm sure you, you, you follow a bit uh, what is cooking on cultural heritage in 2016, we adopted a major communication uh, towards what we call a European Union strategy in international cultural relations. So it's a, it's a major document, a major strategy that really frame our cultural diplomacy. We had three pillars among which one of them was dedicated to intercultural dialogue and peaceful community. Concretely, what has been done after this, uh, this document uh, and especially for <clears throat> for our domain and conflict and crisis related to peace. Um, this integration, it was first, and we have to acknowledge it, mainly tackled under the prism of security. And this was in the wake of a looting and destruction perpetrated by the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. And that has left deep cause in our memory, and I'm sure we, we all remember the, the video of, of destruction. Um, here in the European Union, we, we had various regulations, uh, the Parliament adopted regulation on the import, export of cultural properties. Also in Iraq and Syria, we adopted regulation. Uh, we also remember uh, this collective move of international community and uh, the United Nations Security Council. It was the resolution um, 20, 234047 in 2017. And they mentioned that uh, that it was a war crime to destroy the destruction and, and looting of heritage was, was a war crime. Under our common and security uh, defense policy, still on, 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 the, um, on this framework of security, we also enhance our engagement. And we have a strategic document that we called uh, the compass and in which we define the strategies. And here we put the trafficking of, uh, of cultural property as a priority of our uh, civilian CSDP mission, which are, if you're not familiar with that, a kind of peacekeeping operations, civilian one that we launch within the European Union. Um, 
And in Iraq in 2018, we also have appointed for the first time uh, a senior advisor to tackle especially the question of trafficking in Iraq with the national authorities. Um, but above security, we also have some, some other engagement on cultural heritage from the European Union and our member states. Uh, for instance, we found it in Mali, some project connected to the manuscript of Timbuktu in Balkan. Uh, we rebuild some, some heritage. Um, and we have a very recent uh, project that we found, uh, and the, the project of the mosque was recalled by Christine at the opening. We funded the UNESCO project, Revive the Spirit of Mosul. Uh, it's about 30 millions of um, euro or US dollar, 30 millions of euro that, that we put in the project. And we also have a very uh, important project in Yemen, which is called Cash Cash for Youth. Um, these all were ended all great projects of importance, but these sections, and uh, they were kind of, let's say, disseminated and, and more intuitive personally supported, meaning that we, don't, we did not have any coherent overall strategy for cultural heritage in conflicts and, and crisis. And, and so since, since two or three years, uh, we decided to change the approach. And what has changed? And the trigger came again from a crossroad between our security and cultural approach. It was a cumulative factor. In 2017, we adopted a new framework for peace that we call the European Union Integrated Approach. And, and this integrated approach provides a kind of revitalization of our peace process and security strategies. Um, it aims at adopting a, a holistic approach to take into account all the drivers of the conflict uh, with all of partners during all the conflict cycle. So this is, um, this is really the, the first landmark. The second one, in 2019, we worked and uh, we have council conclusion that were adopted on strategic approach to international cultural relation. The objective was to strengthen the effectiveness and the impact of our foreign policy by integrating international cultural relation in our foreign policy instrument, and especially in all the crisis management, peace process and security strategy. And here with accumulation of, uh, of both um, both political framework, we have a momentum. Cultural heritage was really at the crossroad and could be a potential and a major strategic component in our, in our peace strategies. So how, how did we engage on uh, the integration of cultural heritage in our peace approach in the European Union? Um, we have adopted an iterative approach. In 2019, we launched a first study in a dedicated country, it was in Iraq, on the role of the EU in protecting and enhancing cultural heritage. And, uh, and Elke and, and Damien were, were part of this, uh, this first adventure with, with us. The objective, it was to demonstrate and, um, that the European Union and the member states that already have a lot of, of engagement in, in the countries, um, that cultural heritage that can matter and that can make a difference for, for peace and reconciliation and sustainable developments if we adopt a kind of strategic framework. After this first study uh, that, that, was, that was published in October 2020, we organized an international conference at the autumn on the role of the European Union in cultural heritage in, in conflicts and crisis. And here we really create a political momentum with a massive participation and we have almost uh, 800 participants from across the globe, from EU institutions, uh, member states, civil society, academic groups, partners, and international organizations. And interestingly here, we move to the question of the strict protection of cultural heritage to cultural heritage solely, and how to encompass it in what we call our triple nexus, how to connect the humanitarian sphere with the peace and development sphere. And finally, at the end of 2020, we received a mandate of the Political and Security Committee, which is the executive decisional body of the European Union External Engagement, uh, to draft and to take a dedicated political framework on, on the subject. We have to be underlined, and, and Elke also mentioned it, it was absolutely not challenges, and uh, it was not like in other domains in which we have a kind of battles and, and war over the definition. And we have a, a unanimous agreement for all the member states, which is quite rare in our European Union forum.
And what is quite interesting is that we are going to present history is really in the making, but on the 29th of April, we are back to our uh, political committee to present and submit the concept for, for endorsement and immediate application. So what is inside this new political framework? Uh, a few overview on, on the content. First, we have a strategic approach for cultural heritage. That said that cultural heritage is a political and symbolic component. It's not neutral. There is, there is a risk of, uh, of manipulation. There is a risk of interpretation. And I think the, uh, the mosque of Mosul that was presented is a very good example of, of, of that, of this, this question of symbolism. Uh, cultural heritage, we recognize that it can be a driver of conflict and crisis, but also a vector for, for peace and development. Driver of conflict has a direct or indirect collateral damage. It can foster violence, polarize risk of conflict. There is this question on looting and so on. Vector for peace and development, um, fundamental for, for reconciliation, uh, generate dialogue, generate inclusion, foster lasting peace. We have this question of empowerment, local communities, and with uh, what we, we place, it was the socioeconomic factors with job creations, tourism, and transmission of knowledge. Second, <clears throat> sorry, we have the operational approach that follow the, the conflict cycle, which is more or less the modus operandi for strategic EU engagement with uh, best, best practices. It's, it's uh, first of all, the preventive actions, the inventories, the data collection, the early warning system, the preparedness and mitigation measures, and the importance of digitalization. We have, during the conflict, uh, all the safeguarding measures, the emergency measures that we can have, um, the safe havens, the dialogue, the mediation. And we also have, here, we also managed to have an approach of um, what we call the, the humanitarian side of the European Union instruments. And here, just to recall that cultural heritage and its protection is really connected to, uh, to, 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 to humanitarian law, and that destruction is, can be considered under the status of the ECC as a crime law. Uh, so it's, it's quite interesting also here. And then we have a recovery process. We, we are on the reconstruction, the restoration, revitalization, interfaith dialogue, and, and so on. <clears throat> um, finally, in the concept, we have some guiding principles. We have uh, seven or eight principles to promote the international legal framework, which is quite dense, also to promote partnership and multilateralism, uh, especially with the, with the UN at its core, and I'll like remind it's clearly that uh, we are the first donor, for instance, for, for, for UNESCO, uh, to increase the coherence that we may have between the European Union and, and our, our member states, not to have any overlap and to try to, try to increase the joint approach. Uh, we also support this, uh, this multi-track approach with the attention to local communities, which is quite important, the inclusion, empowerment of women and youth, we have a question of conflict sensitivity to not harm principle and, uh, and, and so on. We, we are, apologies for the technical issue. We also have, an, and which is quite important, the complementarity between intangible and tangible heritage that we underline and that we think is really important, that which we think we need to engage. And we, we have a final principle on the coherence and with a natural heritage and climate change, how climate change impacts cultural heritage. So, so it's, it's quite an, an interesting exploratory point. And finally, to, to, to conclude, and, and not to be too long, and a transition for the future, the presentation that will be done by Damien, five takeaways in the future of, of our European Union engagement. First, a great addition to the European Union geopolitical power. And, and this framework will provide a clear signal like Elke was saying, to, to positioning heritage clearly with a framework, political framework uh, within the European Union. And uh, given uh, the second one is to give more visibility to, to the European Union in, in our external intervention. Not to be seen only the European Union has a, has a funder, but also has a, has a player. And then we have a power of example by raising awareness, promoting successful cases where cultural heritage could be mobilized as a vector for, for peace and reconciliation. Um, 
then we have we can foster a mutual learning engagement with our member state and European institutions. Again, sorry to quote you, Elke, but like, like you said, we have a strong engagement and expertise within uh, within Europe with our member states, and it's of tremendous importance that we manage to, to create a kind of knowledge of community of experts in the field. And finally, to engage on the ground and to improve the capacity and the role of our European Union delegations. And we have almost 150 delegations, kind of, it's, it's the equivalent of, of the national embassies, uh, to engage on cultural heritage on a more coherent, strategic, and systematic ways. I thank you very much for, for listening and uh, over to you, Christine. Thank you very much, Guillaume. Uh, it was really interesting to hear all the very recent development because I feel so much happened since that document was adopted in 2016, right? When we had kind of first initial thoughts towards a strategy, but at the time we saw still a cultural heritage as something that could be the victim of conflict that needed protection. And now it has really changed and expanded. So I think you, ex you explained that really, really well. Just one more reminder, I see that we have quite a few questions coming in, but please continue to use the, the Q&A um, Q box, uh, and we'll look at that after the very last presentation by Damien. And Damien has a PowerPoint. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, before I share my screen, uh, I first would like to uh, thank uh, Professor Kreppel, University of Florida and the Germany Center. Um, you, Christine, uh, for your inviting me. Um, I have very nice memories of uh, when it was still allowed, uh, conferences in London, together with um, uh, our colleagues uh, from the Consortium on uh, Cultural Heritage and Human Rights. Um, and thank you also, uh, Corinne, for uh, organizing uh, all this and coordinating. And, and I'm very glad to uh, be with Elke and uh, Guillaume again. Uh, so thank you all for, for this opportunity. Um, I will start sharing my screen uh, and we'll check if everything is fine. Maybe before commenting on what was said, I will, um, I will just say from whom, where I speak so that it's clear. So I speak on behalf of Culture Solutions. I will say a few words about what Culture Solutions is. Um, in a moment, um, I speak on my own behalf, uh, and my topic today will be about the idea of a transatlantic cultural initiative uh, beyond cultural heritage only. Uh, but I think before making those points, I will try to maybe bounce back on a few things that um, LK has have said, because it's also nice to have a debate. I guess that's also part of the the exercise um, and to have a diversity of views. And also, I think it's important to maybe underline a few points for our uh, US audience, uh, who is not necessarily that familiar with a number of, uh, of European realities. Um, I chose this picture because the name of your program is Beyond Masters and Museums. Uh, and I thought, oh, that's exactly what we need to see uh, in terms of contemporary transatlantic cultural relations with uh, Beyonce and Jay-Z uh, renting the Louvre uh, for a whole night to shoot uh, a, a video of, uh, of one of their songs um, and, and then have millions of views on it and the Louvre benefiting from it and, uh, um, and the Joconde as well benefiting from it uh, if she ever uh, needed it. Um, so that I think the reality we live in uh, uh, with all its complexities, uh, and I think this is what I would like to touch upon later. So what is uh, Culture Solutions in, in, in three uh, points? We are a new, what we call ourselves a, non a social innovation group. Um, 10 years ago, we would have called ourselves a think, a think tank or a think and do tank. I think we're both of that. And our goal is uh, on a non-for-profit basis to contribute to the excellence of EU international cultural relations. So for us, the idea is to be a provider of common goods to all stakeholders who are interested in uh, EU international cultural relations. We'll see what it means. And to make it work as well as possible and to address those challenges that have been mentioned earlier 
and to try to improve the way things are done. And uh, we do this uh, by offering a number of services, research, space for dialogue, training, know-how sharing, and advice for implementation. And we follow a specific theory of change. The picture of it uh, is on the slide. You probably cannot see the details of it, but it's available on our website. So this is where uh, I speak from. And we are nonpartisan and we consider ourselves independent, although we do think that the European integration project is something that is important to us as European citizens, but also to our interlocutors in the world who are contributing or exchanging uh, on the cultural uh, level. Before I run into my presentation, I would like to just um, make a few points about uh, what Elke and, and Guillaume have said. Um, the first point I'd like to make is um, that the, this agenda at the European Union level is very, very, very new. Um, and, and I think the distinction between the national level of European states, European governments, what usually US public would identify Europe with, which is Germany, uh, UK, London, Paris, Barcelona, um, you know, this is still the reality of European cultural engagement in the world, very much so. And the fact that these governments have started to decide that they want to delegate some of this action to a supranational level or a community level of the European Commission, in other words, the, the blue flag with the, the golden stars, is very, very new, and it's it's still not a given. I mean, it, even if there is a consensus on, on the document and the approach that Guillaume has mentioned, I wouldn't say there is that much of enthusiasm or belief from uh, all the societies that, you know, the EU should be the champion of cultural action and engagement in the world. I think it, it's really not that yet, and it's going to take many, many decades before um, the EU level, if ever, supersedes, and I'm not sure even that it, it should happen, but supersedes uh, the influence of, 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 of nations and of uh, national governments. So I think it's very important to really clarify that because the shift towards the EU level is really about a new paradigm. It's about a new paradigm that is, is how to say, legally, politically accepted, but in practice, it has not really transformed into a generalized set or course of action in the EU delegations, what we could EU dele call EU delegations, which are EU embassies in the world. And even among national diplomats of European states, um, it has not really transpired, it has not really trickled down. Uh, national staff is still very much into a national frame of action. They don't think about or very, very little. They don't think about the European dimension of what they do. If they promote Marca Española or the Spanish culture, that's their priority. And they don't have any incentive, apart from Goethe Institute, they don't have any incentive, as I don't know, French Institute uh, staff to, to do European work. So it's very much work in progress. I'm insisting on this because I think we should not provide to our American friends a distorted vision of, of reality of what's uh, happening currently. Now, I fully agree with Elke in terms of challenges. Uh, it doesn't mean that the, it's not because the EU level is not still prominent. That's all the Eurocentrism uh, challenges uh, that uh, Elke has mentioned are not uh, there. Um, but the difference is that the EU framework of action is the expression, the manifestation of this new paradigm. So the notion of mutuality, for instance, uh, the notion of intercultural dialogue is very, very prominent in the EU documents. And this is a shift and this is new. And I think this is what is interesting to contribute to because it is about decolonizing cultural relations. It is about questioning the way uh, Europeans have been acting in the field of cultural heritage management. Um, 
And it is about what we, we see this trend at the moment with um, all the debates about restitution of cultural goods uh, on which member states still have the competence. Um, you know, things are moving a little bit. I'm not saying that there is a revolution, but I think this paradigm, this new paradigm based on mutuality is, is, uh, is, um, is getting enrooted step by step. Now, I'm saying step by step because we've set up culture solutions precisely because we think there is so, still so much resistance uh, against these new paradigms in the EU. And sometimes it's just a lack of action or a lack of resources that there is a need for some people to work on improving the way we do things when we engage culturally with the world as Europeans. Uh, and, and here comes my presentation. It took me uh, seven minutes perhaps to engage in the debate, but I think that was necessary and I hope it will uh, make the, the conversation uh, lively afterwards. So um, the, the premises on which uh, I prepared this presentation is that there is a, an opportunity to actually go beyond the current level of ambition in these EU international cultural relations and to really shape a new initiative uh, between the EU and the US on, uh, in this field. Um, and, uh, and, and here, I think the, the key message is that culture is becoming strategic in a very tense international context. And building trust between allies or societies that still have a lot to share is uh, not only a, a humanistic priority, but it's also become a, a political uh, and, and, and a strategic priority. And, and I, I think this is important to take that into account. So building trust, uh, strengthening links between societies, uh, I think is something that, uh, um, we are interested in and um, give a stronger, a st more strongly cultural, emotional, human dimension to the relationship between the EU and the US beyond the personalized, you know, um, ways of, of showing the relationship. I'm, I'm referring to the recent interview of the French president by CBS News, in which he was asked a question about the, you know, multiculturalism in, in, in US and French or European societies, that's fine. But I think if many other experts could engage in this debate beyond the French president, I think it would enrich the conversation, not saying that what he's saying is not interesting, but I think it's about societies and it's not just about presidents. Um, so I think we should think in, in ambitious terms um, and uh, some aspects of the initiative that we could imagine uh, relate to cultural heritage, but they also relate to a number of challenges that Elke and Guillaume have uh, sketched out. So on the, I, I'm not sure it's on the left-hand side on your screen, but on mine, it is on the left-hand side in the yellow bubble, we have the cultural heritage and security. Is it on your left-hand side? Yes, so on the left-hand side, we have what, Guillaume has, said, has talked about cultural heritage and security or peace with the work we've done together uh, in last year um, to, to prepare for this EU concept. But we also have, for instance, um, memories and cultural heritage, which to me relate to the colonial past, to the uh, persisting influence of European powers. On the top right, uh, there is what I think should be developed as a EU UN, US UNESCO package. You mentioned UNESCO, you know, um, with the US coming and going. Um, I think there should be a renewed initiative on UNESCO precisely to rethink a little bit the way uh, we could engage together. Um, then um, another thing that is quite classic, which is on the left bottom, bottom left is boosted mobility while well, we are here thanks to the Erasmus plus program as far as I understood so uh, thank you to uh, DG uh, culture and education in the European Commission they are the ones managing the budget that is uh, funding this uh, activity but I, when I looked at the numbers of students uh, from both sides 
engaged in, in uh, Erasmus Plus. I was not very impressed. I think it was around 400 uh, students from the States uh, going to, to the EU. I found that that was very small as a figure. So I, I'm pretty sure we could really be more ambitious in terms of uh, cultural exchange in the broad uh, sense of the term. Uh, not only artistic uh, exchanges, but also um, educational, scientific, um, so culture in the broad sense. And then there is the uh, multiculturalism and intercultural dialogue uh, uh, bubble, which is about how we manage differences uh, at the cultural level, how we uh, manage our societies, how we manage diversity in our societies, how we fail at doing that. Uh, and how we talk about it and how we learn from uh, one another about how we manage uh, diversity in our societies and in our international relations. I think this is becoming a, a, a crucial uh, topic to, to, to really be more um, elaborate uh, about uh, in today's world. And finally, the climate change uh, priority. Uh, in previous publications at Culture Solutions, we studied the idea of a global uh, EU initiative for uh, culture and climate change. There have been recent reports by e ECOMOS on uh, that topic, cultural heritage management and climate change. I think both the EU and US have something in common to, to develop together. And here, and that's gonna be the last point of, on this slide, I'm convinced that the Jean Monnet centers in the US could actually be very good conveners of uh, debates about those topics uh, to create a new dynamics. Um, and the, maybe uh, to, to end uh, on, on the, the how doing this, um, it has to be um, a joint effort by a number of stakeholders or actors that come from very different horizons. So it should be multi-stakeholders and it should last at least five to seven years to have an impact. So, um, oh, it's time to stop. So um, yeah, I, I would say let's, let's allow ourselves to be ambitious, to be self-critical as well, uh, but trying to be a little bit imaginative on what uh, we could build together as cultural professionals on, on a very complex and contested uh, topics. Thank you very much. And I would stop sharing to follow the advice of... <sighs> Thank you so much, Damien, for this uh, wonderful and again, thought provoking uh, presentation. It was quite uh, interesting, I guess, also to all the students listening. Uh, we had a little bit uh, of an exercise before this webinar uh, in trying to identify possible topics of cooperation between the EU and the US and actually climate change was one of the ones that was uh, identified as a possible um, area uh, of priority. I will perhaps start uh, with you, Damien, if you don't mind. There's been a couple of questions uh, coming sp specifically for you, and then I'll go back to LK and Guillaume. Um, you mentioned uh, you know, that uh, European states still very much can favoring national uh, action uh, over EU, and that there's a slow progress towards you know, giving leadership to the EU in the sector. Uh, and one question is to, to what extent a lack of belief perhaps from European societies, hinders the effectiveness of the EU policies in that area. I'll perhaps let you think about this one and then ask yeah, you another please. one. Please, yes. Uh, we can you. respond as, as uh, uh, together. Uh, the other one is, is uh, quite a practical question, actually, is how American uh, audiences and actors in the cultural sectors can identify partners uh, and possible cooperation project um, as European rather than French, German, Spanish. You know, how can they go about identifying possible partners uh, in doing and going about doing projects together? Would you like me to answer the second question immediately or is it for all panelists? Just both, as you wish. So I'll, I'll reply very quickly on the second one to let my dear colleagues uh, um, give their views. On identifying partners, uh, I would say um, there are many European networks specialized in specific cultural uh, fields of expertise or action. So I would encourage uh, American um, colleagues, organizations to 
look at the various cultural networks uh, if they also want to have more um, hints about where to find them and they can contact culture solutions because that's precisely one of our roles there is to be a kind of a go between uh, uh, in that type of situation then there is the eu delegation in the us uh, which uh, has a cultural uh, unit uh, and then there are uh, eu um, representative offices of a number of uh, cooperation programs such as erasmus plus or uh, Erasmus um, uh, offices in certain universities and so on. So um, I think these are the entry points that you can try to, to use. Great, did you wanna say something about this uh, lack of uh, beliefs question? Uh, because you did mention, you know, that yeah. they're still favoring the, the national kind of actions in the, in the area rather than the EU. And to uh, what, if you to look, what extent if you, that hinders yeah. Yeah. I think if you look at Eurobarometers or all polls, opinion polls on the, how Europeans feel about the EU project and so on, the, the belonging to the EU project is still uh, above 50%. So um, it's decreasing, sometimes it, it increasing a, a bit, but it's, it's still, there's still a majority of, of EU citizens according to Eurobarometers, which are the EU-wide polls run regularly by the European uh, institutions. Um, there's still a belief in the European project. Now, um, obviously with, then the, the question is how fragmented uh, are societies about feeling European? Uh, and, and this is a very complex matter because you have societies uh, influenced by politics. You look at Hungary or Poland or Italy that have been flagged as um, less cohesive societies with the EU project by uh, think tanks such as the European Council for Foreign Relations in a previous study a few years ago on cohesion. Um, and then you have uh, young generations that are much more convinced by the added value of the EU project, including in the UK, because if you look at young British people, they have voted massively against Brexit. So it's very hard to generalize. And, and this is why it's very important to invest in the knowledge of perceptions and the knowledge of public opinions. And the EU has understood this in terms of investing more regularly in different countries in uh, surveys on how the EU is perceived by uh, societies outside the EU. Thank you. Uh, I'll, we have got a, quite a few questions and not much time, but we'll try to go through uh, all of them. And I'll let, of course, Guillaume, if he wants to add anything or LK on, on your responses. But there is one perhaps that I want to I wanna pose to Guillaume um, from Jean Luna, uh, because we were discussing, you know, this difficult kind of balance to strike uh, in preserving cultural heritage, you know, the collective kind of interest and other perhaps local interest. So the question is, and I'm sure you may have uh, already a, an answer, is that is there an underlying unanimous agreement that maps the role by which countries should respond in the case of international conflict uh, in cultural heritage terms? Uh, and if there isn't, should there be? <laughs> mm, yes, th 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 thanks a lot, Christian. No, just to, uh, <clears throat> to, to build on, on what Damien was, was saying, so tremendously right on, on the embassy on both sides and the American one in Brussels and the European one in, in Washington should be a, a, an excellent uh, point, point, point of contact and not to lose yourself in the, in the maze of the European institution. Uh, on, the, um, on, on the overall approach of, of a balance, maybe ju just a reminder, uh, and Damien pointed out clearly that the European Union is quite a fresh new construction and that for sure, the member states do play a preeminent pre role. And culture um, is part of what we call the third pillar. So we are here in a kind of enhanced cooperation and, and not, not a true power of, of the European Union. So I know that from the states, it, it, it might be weird to, to perceive the, the, this kind of construction of European Union that we have, which is never a member states, never an international organization, uh, and in between, but I think that it's it, it's really in construction. We do not start from a une page vierge, from a, from a blank sheets, and we have a history of our member states. Um, we have a common peace project, and I think that that is important. And 
and it's it's what really we placed on the the common cultural heritage that we we try to 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 move together. And on your other approach, maybe to answer to your question, yes, I think that what what can what we have to look at now is the uh, really this human center approach and the local community center center based approach. And I think that here that does really matter. And here uh, I see a lot of joint approach with the United States when, when engaging in the ground. We have to first uh, ask the local community what they do think. Damien was reminding the pool and the survey of how many people to commit to the peace project. We have to systematically do the same when engaging on cultural heritage. Ask, ask people on the ground because we do work for them. We do not work, work for yes for, for us and, and over. So I think here, my answer will not be a country based, but a human centered based. Ask ask people on the ground. No, I think that's a that's a great response and also one that um, is in line with our, the, our research project on the question that we had for several years because we had a very much of a human rights centered approach. So, which means that people should not just have access to heritage, but also have the means to participate, you know, in the cultural heritage governance. And that starts from the bottom up. And you see also all the influence of what's happened with indigenous people, for example, in terms of developing, you know, meaningful ways of consultation, etc. So uh, I think that's uh, probably the way forward. Um, there are a couple of questions I would like to perhaps specifically uh, ask LK. Uh, you mentioned kind of the lack of challenges um, and we have here a couple of questions that relate to what's happening in other areas, other regions of the world. Um, Elisa Graville is asking, what do you think of the Silk Road politic of China uh, from a heritage point of view? Uh, and do you think it's a parallel road to the UNESCO one? Uh, and I'll ask the second one uh, together as well. Um, the other one is about challenges um, from African nations, which I think is interesting as well. Uh, you mentioned the, also the experts you know, being trained uh, in Europe and going back to their own country. And we see sometimes some tension uh, in, rest, in the restitution debate, right? When you would have uh, certain um, experts from Global South who may have been trained in, in Europe and come back to uh, their home country and are faced sometimes with tensions because they don't have uh, the same views anymore of local communities. So I think there's a, a interesting discussion there. So perhaps if you want to develop a bit on this question on China and Africa. Thanks. Um, I'll just add one sentence to the question that Guillaume just answered while my brain tries to think about China. Um, because this, this international response to heritage, um, I think it's also interesting for, for people who, who are looking into this and the ones who ask the specific question to look at what's happening at an international level, because this debate has been taken up in terms of the UN response and in terms of debates around RTP, so the responsibility to protect, and um, also at the level of yeah, UN peacekeeping. All of this is very new. So there is, as Kiyom said, there is, there is no common approach. And I fully agree with what you've both also responded in terms of what's locally desired and needed. But, but the RTP discussion, and there are some publications about this as well by Thomas Wies, um, I think are, are very interesting to look at in this regard. And I'll now move to China, which um, is unfortunately not a country that I'm, I'm particularly um, familiar with. Um, aside from from you know security council and that kind of things but what what i know from the silk roads project and and its general approach um to, to this type of projects is that of course what what chinese interests are are um to look at chinese influence within within that region and then the region of, of, of central asia in, in particular and to also uh, in a way um counterbalance a bit the, the, the history that we've had looking at the Silk Road as you know going from Europe <laughs> to China or going from the Middle East to China and China wants to look very much at the, the opposite direction what, what was you know transmitted the other way around um, and I think in that in that from that perspective it's, it's it's interesting of course because the more the more different perspectives we can have on, on, on similar uh, periods in history I think I think the better but in terms of of, of um, their their you know specific uh, political takes on that I, I really um, 
um, you know, would, would rather not <laughs> go, go into the details without knowing them exactly. Um, regarding the, the African, the question about African nations, um, the, the, the bit that I particularly refer to in, in like half a sentence, um, I was thinking about uh, something that happened uh, at UNESCO in 1970, like late 60s, uh, early 70s, um, where, you know, when, when um, African states, most of them became independent, they very quickly, very early on became UNESCO member states. And if you look at the, the, um, the balance in member state numbers, they go from having almost no representation, right, Egypt and, 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 um, and South Africa, and then suddenly they become the biggest bloc regionally uh, in a span of two years. Um, and UNESCO has, contrary to the Security Council, so has a one country, one vote system, which means if you're the biggest regional bloc, you actually are relatively powerful within the system, um, especially if you would then team up with other <laughs> blocs with, with, with numerous member states. Um, and what, what you saw happening in 1970 with the adoption of the Convention on, on Illicit Trafficking is that um, for the first time, and actually the only time uh, in UNESCO's history, they adopt a convention very much uh, put forward by uh, the G77, so by African African states um, and others, but you know, with a very dominant African voice, um, which is all about national ownership of heritage, and which is very different from the, the traditional universal approach to heritage that UNESCO has been promoting, because of course these newly independent states, they had an interest in getting their heritage back, in getting control over their own heritage, and they were quite worried that <laughs> their formal colonial rulers would continue dominating their heritage fields. Now, what you see um, is and this is one of the examples that I called where you actually see a complete uh, pushback. Um, Europe and the US let them have it, right? So the convention passes, the convention is adopted, but no one of the, the powerful members ratifies it. They don't ratify until the 90s, some even in the 2000s, some still haven't ratified. Um, and that also means that a lot of these conventions um, like World Heritage, they, they become popular because they get a lot of additional funding for operations. Um, so if none of these countries with a lot of money ratify, it also means the convention becomes, it's a bit of debt, right? So at UNESCO for a long time, the 1970 convention um, didn't have much resources. It had like one staff member or sometimes half a staff member, um, whereas the World Heritage Center had hundreds of people working for World Heritage alone. And, and so you, you see them uh, pushing back on that victory, in, in this case of the African countries, simply by not participating. Um, but then also by the following year, like really soon after, I think 1970 adopted at the end of 1970, 1971, um, a number of European experts meet in Washington DC um, and start discussing the World Heritage Convention. And basically the idea of, we need a different approach here. We need to go back to this universal picture. So let's do something different. And by 1972, you get a new convention, which becomes, of course, they couldn't predict that it would become as powerful as it has, but 1970 very quickly, you know, disappears of the scene, and that's that. What that's what you see happening a few times in 1980s again. You have uh, an African Director General at UNESCO, um, the first African head of a specialized agency at the UN, who is basically forced to not stand for re-election. The US claimed he was corrupt, that he was too much siding with the G77, he was not supportive enough for <laughs> for a number of countries. Uh, this is all around the time that, that the US and UK actually leave the organization, but he in the end doesn't stand for re-election, he leaves, he's replaced by European, by a Spanish person. and. Um, and you see that happening at a few crucial crucial moments uh, in their history. Um, so that's kind of the point that I was referring to, and I hope that more or less answered um, that question. That's a really fascinating point, and I really like the way you explained the link as well with the, between the 1917 convention and the 1972. I think that's quite really fascinating, and one we um, don't even you know know of or think of. Um, but it's true that until quite recently, the means for the 1970 convention were not put in place um, in, in terms of state reporting, et cetera. It's only quite recently that there's been a realization and perhaps linked also with the, this issue of trafficking of you know, the possible links to tourism, et cetera. 
but there's yeah, a no, realization that, <laughs> that you need you need cooperation and and everybody needs to to work um towards the the effectiveness of the convention uh, at least that, that that's really interesting fascinating i'll perhaps just give you the floor to you all one more time if you want have any final remark um and i'd like to ask you the very perhaps last uh, question as well that we have here, um, which is a question about should we characterize uh, the efforts of standard standardizing uh, the approach uh, to cultural heritage preservation as a form of new imperialism. Um, and I, I'd like perhaps to tie this question that is really for, for UNESCO's effort to uh, the EU a little bit more, because in the preparatory action, and that's been, I think, quite well translated, uh, after in the in the EU documents is that there was a conscious move from you know cultural diplomacy to uh, um, strengthening cultural relations and to really uh, listening to the other and this kind of mutual mutual dialogue. And what I was I would be curious to to know also from all of you is to what extent you think that has been achieved. Uh, you for example you mentioned your Iraq study I know you interviewed people uh, there as well. To what extent do you think? Uh, that the move has been actually um, affected in practice, uh, if you will, if, if there is a sense that we've moved away from a kind of uh, neo-imperialism and, and a true cooperation and equal kind of partnership and, and dialogue with, with people. So perhaps, I don't know who would like to go first, I'll perhaps give the floor again to uh, Guillaume. And then Damien and Elke to conclude. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Christian. Not, not, not easy to answer that question from <laughs> my perspective, uh, but challenging one for sure. I would say we're, we're work in progress for sure. And that was the reason why, and you mentioned it, we decided to change the perspective and not to have this neo-imperialist approach, but to take really the, the human-centered approach. It's true that the European Union we do also have the history of, of our member state and we cannot get rid of the past. And, and Elke re reminded, reminded very clearly, we need to raise awareness. It will take time. And, and I think that what, what we engage on, and especially with, with, a, new, with a new generation that, that I do belong in, in our born in the 80s and, and, and 90s, have a different perspective. I think it will take time. But it's the story of Europe. It, everything takes time, and we need to move really step by step. But I'm I'm quite confident that that we could manage to to make things change, to adopt a human-centered approach. Uh, but it will take time, and we need to to raise awareness, and we need to to do this work, and to believe in the European Union project. Thank you. And perhaps now, Damien. Um, so two, three points on this, but about neo-imperialism um, from Europe through UNESCO, I would say on policy level, absolutely not. On policy level, the, the shift and the paradigm has been already um, validated, decided on political and policy level. So I would completely reject this argument. In practice, it's all about training people, um, changing uh, behaviors, working together, managing diversities. And this is why uh, my presentation was about launching new initiatives, because it's only new, through new initiatives that you refresh the way you engage with others. Um, and the third point I would, I would put uh, forward is be careful. Let's be very, very cautious about Euro bashing. Euro bashing uh, is something that can be very easy to do um, and, and used as well as fake news by certain governments that are precisely very afraid of the way the EU is behaving and is developing its policies. I'm convinced, and this is why we are launching culture solutions and working on this project, the EU has much more to contribute as an enabling power than a normative power. I think the, the normative power theory is, is, um, is becoming weaker uh, because uh, it's not only about norms, it's about being attractive in, uh, in a more diverse way. 
Um, and I think the, the EU decision makers have understood this. So let's, let's be careful about EU bashing. Uh, I think it's not the right way. It's more about understanding what the EU is doing in a more detailed way, and then engaging in detailed conversations about what the, what the EU does. Thanks a lot, great final words. Uh, and now LK, if you wanna add something to that. No, I have to be really careful about what I say. <laughs> <laughs> because um, I think, of course, there's there's a difference between between the past and the present. And I think if we look at the past, if we look at uh, the times when the norm was shaped, if we look at the period all throughout the seventies, eighties, and so on, um, it has a lot of characteristics of neo-imperialism. Um, if you look at what People like Michael Barnett have, have, you know, compared humanitarianism with 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 imperial structures and you know the top down approach, the, the the lack of consent from from local communities and, and so on. Um, and I, I think a lot of the, the heritage regime did, did follow um, that, and and into a certain extent sometimes still does that. Now I'm not talking about the EU. I'm talking about the global heritage regime. Um, of course. Uh, these states themselves are not, and then I talk about states in the global south, they're not completely um, <laughs> out of this either, you know, at some point they all want to play the international game. Uh, so there's what communities want, then there's the states who do, they, they, they want to play a role in this international stage, so, so that they just also adopt, they want to be part of the UNESCO system. Um, and then there is, I think, um, what is happening at the moment and, and some of you have spoken about uh, you know giving greater voices to local level uh, inclusion of, of, of local um uh, of local communities and uh practically I, I don't know if that is already happening but i think that the intention uh, is increasingly there i think the the eu policy that the the communication 2016 one cultural diplomacy does shift this idea of we're no longer just going to promote europe abroad we, we see this more as a dialogue thing so i think there is there is a tendency of of trying to change this at different levels and i think also within organizations like unesco this this aim is there um sometimes practically it's still quite difficult because because <laughs> um you know that they're they're stuck with a norm as it were which doesn't always allow a lot of room for for a broad diversity of voices and you can see if you look at the way in which unesco has dealt with cultural diversity in in the past that it's it's not been an easy relation and that they've tried um and, but it's been very often about diversity between states it's much more difficult when it starts being about diversity within states which is often the key problem right the fact that belgium is different from china is much less of an issue than the diversity within belgium or the diversity within china and there politically speaking it starts becoming um, a lot more complex but so I think the answer is a bit yes and no, yes in the past and hopefully not anymore in the future. So I think we'll end on that rather positive note. Mm -hmm. uh, I th thank you to all for really engaging conversation. I think uh, we had really a lot of questions and that speaks to uh, the, the way you presented your own topics. And I'll just leave the floor to Professor Krepel to conclude this webinar. Thank you so much. I really just want to thank all of the panelists. It was really engaging. We've already had requests to know when the recorded version will be available online. So we really value the, the contributions. Uh, thank you again to, to Kristen and her colleagues for working with us throughout this semester on the JMCE project. And thank you to the commission who of course takes no responsibility for anything that anyone has said but who nonetheless provides the resources to allow us to say these things. So with that, good evening to some, good afternoon to others, and good morning to others uh, in the land of Zoom. Uh, and thanks to everyone for participating, attendees and panelists.